Wonderful. So I'm Andrew Sargent, Director of New South Wales Health Pathologies Point of Care Service, and it's with great pleasure that we introduce John. Many of you will know him, but for those that don't, John's an emergency physician, a medical project officer with the Emergency Care Institute. Um, he does lots of research and provides clinical content across all areas. He sits on various um, state bodies, including the Cardiac Network Chest Pain Pathway Working Group, which is a big mouthful, but he has a true passion for this area. And without further ado, we'll hand it over to John. We'll thank him again for hopefully what's a wonderful educational presentation. Thanks, Andrew. Yep, we'll jump straight in then. Uh, so it's about acute coronary syndrome. Um, the drivers for a, a, a lot of change in the last couple of years have been uh, RCAs and um, so significant bad outcomes with uh, chest pain or acute coronary syndrome. Um, I'll go straight to the summary because I think it's, um, uh, it's worthwhile. What I want you to do is to make your own pathway uh, based on ours. So I know that um, I've, I strongly believe that there is um, no one pathway that will work in two EDs. I don't think that there's one pathway that's going to work across 184. Clinical assessment is still the most important part. It, it was the, one of the first things that I got taught 35 years ago, and, it, and it's still relevant. It's, it's still the most important part. Now, it's just one, two, three. Exclude a STEMI and find high-risk patients. They get reperfused, they get admitted, they get discussed. Then we look for low-risk patients. We add on ECGs and tropes. If they're negative, they go home and they follow up with a GP. I think, and the evidence suggests, that low-risk patients with normal ECGs and, and negative tropes don't need stress testing. The big group and the thing that is important to uh, think about is the intermediate group. Now, that the percentage of people that fall into the intermediate group, somewhere between 30 and 70% of patients are going to be intermediate. And this is a group that, even if they have normal ECGs and normal tropes, they're still intermediate risk. I believe that all intermediate patients should be discussed and a significant portion of them should be able to go home, but a significant number of them are going to need to be admitted for early testing. Now we'll go into some detail. This is the uh, suspected, um, this is the cover of one of the older versions. And have you noticed that we've actually managed to put guideline and protocol on there? If we could somehow fit pathway on the same page, that would be good. Uh, it doesn't matter. I don't care. Um, if you're doing your own, you can call it whatever uh, you want to do it. There'll always be somebody in the room that gets upset about it. So I often call it, when I'm talking to large groups, I'll call it a thingy, which doesn't seem to upset anybody. Now, go to the thingy. So this is telling me to go. I'm going to go straight to the, uh, to the pathway. And so forget about the quick strolling. This is the first page. Uh, second page, this is just the usual stuff that's on any uh, ministry thing. I won't say forget about that, but we can go for it quick for the purposes of time. Now, this is page one. So basically, we look for on the left-hand side is your flow, and on the right-hand side is the details, and there's an element of colour matching. So this is all, none of this is news to you. Symptoms of myocardial ischemia, which you can see here. Uh, general management. Uh, go over to the box there and you can see a few more details, uh, IV access, routine bloods. This is all sort of standard stuff and is in all of the past pathways and probably the pathways you've got at the moment. You've got that to your initial assessment. Identify STEMI, which is obviously important, and how that's done depends on your place. And there's a number of different places here, but you might, some, you might be getting an ECG transmitted from a LifePak 15 that goes directly to somewhere who reads it, or you might have senior ED clinicians who read it, or you might be sending it to somebody. Um, so you, whatever pathway you follow in your place, you do. If it's a STEMI, then you go to STEMI. If it's not, about um, the, uh, the other causes or the other diagnoses that you've got to think about which are bad. I'm coming back to this, so don't get alarmed if it all seems too quick. Uh, and then we go to which I think is the most important thing to talk about, the cardiac risk assessment. Was that here? Now, if we just, I'm just going to make this all very small so it fits on uh, one screen. We can see that it's got your cardiac risk assessment, tropinology, and your management. 
So this is a clinical risk assessment. That's important to think about. We're going to add on our tests, our troponins with our ECGs, and then we're going to manage. If you're high risk, you're going down into high risk, which is admit, unless something makes you get off that pathway. So you've got something else going on uh, that may be sepsis or a PE or something like that. If you're not high risk, you think about, am I low risk? And if you get through there with negative troponins and negative ECGs, low risk is seek and treat other things or go home. You don't need a stress test. Well, that's what we believe. You can do your own thing if you have different opinions in your places. But the intermediate risk is a different group. The most important thing in this box is discharge. If you do discharge an intermediate patient, then it's with a locally agreed process for further testing. And that's important. So what that testing is, is going to be different wherever you are. It might be exercise stress test. It might be a CTCA. If they're at the uh, very worrying end of the intermediate risk group, they may end up uh, being admitted and getting uh, angiography. So I'm just going to put my seat up. I'm losing a bit of gas out of my chair. Um, I'll come to the list of what I'm just going through quickly. And then the from I says, well, you've all seen these sort of pathways. Again, very simple. Um, yes, no, and you can't get lost there, and the details are on the right-hand side. Now, the next model thing is how I envisage this working is, is that you have a big A3 with this one, this one, and this one on the wall. This is going to be provided in a Word document, so you don't have to have all these details of all the tests on it. You just have your tests. And you can change these boxes depending on the level of seniority of doctors that you have, um, the doctors and nurses that are assessing patients, and you can make that fit uh, into this pathway. So the idea is, is that we're not. this is something that you adjust and then put on your wall as an A3. And the thing that you, that you can't change, but there's a lot more basic checklist. So you've got your big A3 on the wall, and that's telling you how to do it. And then you're going to tick box off here on your, on your checklist to make sure that you've done these things. And this is also going to be useful for data collection uh, if it becomes electronic. This is a statewide form, so the chances of that happening are real if slim and small. So I'll just quickly go through that. Again, the, it matches and maps very uh, closely the pathway that we've got there. Initial assessment, identify STEMI. If that's the case, then you go to STEMI. Otherwise, you've got risk, troponology, and your management. And then it basically physician decision there. If you think they've got a STEMI uh, and they're going to get thrombolized, um, then these are the uh, we've got the details here again for you on that. Now I'm just going to jump back into the presentation. Don't be alarmed. Now it's all about risk. I've got this nice little graphic here. You've got to decide: is it high risk? It's intermediate. So intermediate is simply not high risk, high risk, it's in between. Just to jump back a wee bit, the risk of disease and pretest probability was done really well. PE does it well with the Wells criteria or whatever criteria. We assess a patient for clinical risk, what's in front of us, what's their hist past history, what's their current history, and what do they look like. It's all clinical. We combine it, uh, and then we make a decision on whether we add tests. And with PE, for example, You've got the um, D-dimer test for our uh, unlikely to be PE or low risk. We add the D-dimer and then they can go home. It's not a PE. We've got to look for something else. But um, with chest pain, it didn't happen like that. The cardiologists, um, because they did a lot of research and, and obviously held the problem uh, at the start, they looked at had a disease process. They had a patient with an acute myocardial infarction, and then they looked back as to how they might have been able to pick that early on. So they um, developed things like the Timmy risk score, the thrombolysis and myocardial infarction score, and the GRACE scores, which, because they were looking back once they had a diagnosis, this is not the undifferentiated patient that we see, the person who comes in off, off the street, we've got to assess them. Um, but the, So the cardiologist developed a number of these risk scores, which worked quite well, but they weren't designed to work um, they weren't necessarily initially designed to work in the emergency department. Now, the heart score is another one that you may have heard about, which was actually specifically designed to work in emergency departments. But uh, for those of you that know it, we know that it actually has a troponin in it. So it's not strictly a uh, pre-test probability because it's got troponin in it. And the EDAX, which we'll talk a little bit about, is a true 
uh, pre-test probability, and I think that's the one that we should be using. But having said that, um, a lot of places, uh, Timmy's like a teddy bear um, for cardiologists and a number of ED doctors, they're not willing to give it up because it's been around for a long time, then use it. It's all the same. Uh, they all work just as well, but I think EDAX works best, just as well, of course. So identified problems from when we look at the RCAs and all the near misses is that there is lack of a poor clinical assessment of patients, no ongoing clinical assessment, and that was a really big one and contributed to a, a number of RCAs. And what I mean by that is, is that uh, we looked at the patient and I did a troponin and then I'm resting all of everything I do thereafter on the ECGs and the troponin and I'm forgetting about the clinical assessment that I made of that patient at the start. And that's an absolute uh, key part to making it work and, and not missing things. Inappropriate use of tests and lack of follow-up of tests, which are always uh, crop up from time to time as problems. Now, a protocol, a pathway, or a guideline, you can call it Eugene, you can call it a thingy, you can call it anything you want. Um, it should allow for a good clinical assessment and judgment. It should mitigate for a risk where that judgment is not so good. So we know that a pathway has to guide places, and we know there's a lot of small places out there that don't have great seniority of doctors and nurses. It needs to lead users to make good, safe decisions and prompt rethinking. So the cognitive part of a pathway or a guideline or a thingy is to allow you to rethink and change your mind. And then it has to also allow and prompt you to call for help and support. Worst case scenario is that um, it's a paint by numbers thing and that's what we want to try and avoid as much as possible. But uh, if it has to be that, then uh, it should be able to perform some way in that. Now, let's just go back to the thingy again. So now we've, so we've talked about the pre-test probability. Stop scrolling quickly, we're making you dizzy. Now the cardiac risk assessment. High risk uh, is something that we know. This definition out of the uh, Steen Australian Heart Foundation, and it's all pretty much a no-brainer, ongoing chest discomfort despite treatment, dynamic ECG changes, et cetera, et cetera. I won't just read them out for you. If there's none of those problems, then we have time to assess, is this patient low risk? And if they're low risk, and then we get on the pathway and we, um, we do our troponins and our serial ECGs. Just to remind you that, of course, serial ECGs and general management are at least two ECGs, but if there's ongoing pain and patients look sick, then you should keep doing ECGs. It's just electricity and a bit of time. Once we've made our assessment and we know where we are, we tend to stay in our columns, but we add on our other tests. So it's just like PE, we've got our pre-test uh, pre probability. If you're low risk at the start, you can become high risk with abnormal ECGs or if you have any high risk features, but if you don't have any of those things, then you're low risk at the end. But conversely, if you're intermediate risk at the start, it doesn't matter how negative everything else is, you're still intermediate risk. So it's important, and I'll just reiterate that point, it seems like I'm going on about it, but this intermediate box, this intermediate risk group, these are the ones that should be admitted. Now I'll just scroll through that again. Um, for the EDAX, I'd suggest everybody, you can do it right now at home if you want, everybody should get uh, go to MDCALC, which is just M-D-C-A-L-C, just put that into your browser and you'll find it. Uh, and you can find EDAX. This is E-D-A-C-S. This is a great, uh, I think it's something that was, um, it, it's a great risk assessment tool. It was derived uh, in EDs by uh, Martin Thann and Louise Cullen, who are probably uh, considered by everybody to be the Australasian gurus of troponins and um, rapid uh, cardiac assessment pathways. Uh, and it reads nicely. The pearls and pitfalls read nicely. They give you a good sense approach. Um, tells you why, do you why you should use it and how you should use it. Uh, it just has age, risk factor, least intuitive sense. You know, if somebody's diaphoretic, you can probably see this on my screen, and they've got pain uh, radiating into the uh, neck and jaw, if I click those as yes, and take away those other things, then this is going to be a not low risk and then the patient should go onto the pathway. But what I suggest is go and have a plot that, patients that you have that you can remember um, and uh, see if they fit and work, if it works for you.
So high risk, we've talked about. Low risk, we've talked about. Now, you can use in the low risk box, you'll see this thing that says age less than 45, symptoms atypical in angina. This is the definition that it was in Heart Foundation um, uh, paper in, uh, for 2016, which a lot of people reflect back on. But for me, this is not that useful because, you know, I'm not even thinking they've got ACS so they fit into that. You can use it if you want, but I suggest EDAX or Heart or Timmy or use something like that. Intermediate risk, this is, the, this is the group that I'm concerned about because this is the group where our bad things happen. Obvious things are obvious. Low-risk patients are low-risk, but the intermediate ones are where bad things happen. Now, we see here the EDAX. Um, all this is just your age. So you get a lot of scoring systems with your age. The risk factors, as we know from a number of studies, only apply to patients 18 to 50. If you're over that, then you're, then you're too old to, um, for risk factors to make a difference over the fact that your age is significant. So you get a big number. For example, the numbers start ramping up after you get um, over 50. And then these four questions, diaphoresis, pain into the arm, shoulder, neck or jaw, and, or, um, and then you get negative if it's worse by inspiration or you can pr put pressure on it and it comes on. So that was just to remind me to show you MD Calc. You should use that. It's great. Uh, heart score. Heart score is different. It's actually, um, it's been validated uh, a lot in EDs recently and it's been shown to be as good as Timmy. So um, that uh, helped with a lot of the uh, our um, uh, phys clinicians who like to have uh, use the uh, Timmy, um, but the problem with Timmy is is that uh, with heart score, sorry, is, is that it uses troponin, and for me, it's so it's not a true pre uh, pre test clinical score. It just this is just your first troponin, and it's got things that are open to um, interpretation. You know, highly suspicious, moderate, moderately suspicious. That's great if you've been around for 20 years and you know what you're doing, but it's not necessarily great um, if you're quite junior. So disposition. Look for a STEMI risk assess, add the tests. Disposition is based on the risk assessment plus the tests, so it's combined. You need senior input to get off the high-risk pathway, and you need senior input to get out of hospital if, you, if you're intermediate risk. Obviously, if you're going to stay in hospital, you're going to have to admit them and talk to seniors. So um, it's all going through quite quickly because we have time for questions. Now, troponins, how hard can it be? Um, there has been something like 300 papers. I think the, uh, Andrew and the, and the group would uh, attest that there's an enormous amount of literature out there and a lot of it's conflicting. So I'm going to try and make it very simple because I'm very simple. This is the box that we've put up. You've got your, th your three troponin T's that are currently in use in New South Wales, and it's positive if it's more than this number here. That's the upper limit of normal, as you see it on your laboratory, or the 99th centile. If you don't want to think about what the 99th centile is, don't bother. Just think of it as the upper limit of normal. It's positive if there's a delta. We're saying more than five nanograms per litre at two hours. So high sensitivity troponin, zero and two hours, and the others are there. Point of care tests are done at zero and six hours, and we use these differently. Now, this is the thing that um, uh, might be uh, a little bit concerning or confusing for people. So it's positive if it's more than 0 0.08. We're not using a delta. I know that a lot of you are probably thinking, well, in some places they're using a delta for point of care test, and I know that there are some current studies going, particularly in New Zealand, has just finished using a deltas for point of care tests. But I'm going to show you why I think that at the moment, I don't think that we should be doing that. So high sensitivity troponin. Your troponin does this. It just ticks along, or somebody else's troponin does this. Over days, not hours, it rumbles up and down. And if you get a little bit sick and your kidney function starts going off and then gradually it starts drifting up. So don't forget, don't worry about what those numbers are, but that's what your troponin does. Over days or months, it'll gradually wither, but it's not going up quickly. If you have an infarct, it shoots up. If you've got profound sepsis and it's affecting your, uh, your whole system, then it might go up quickly. If you've got a PE, it might go up quickly. So badness makes it go up quickly, but none more so than an acute infarct. So this happens over minutes to hours. Now, we've got the 99th centile, or the upper, upper limit of normal, if you want to think of it like that. 
and we've got down here is the lower limit of detection. So say you've got three, if you've got a high sensitivity to troponin, you've got three to 14. Three is not what the number is, it's less than three, and they can't measure it very accurately at those low levels. So here goes my troponin here. That could be Andrew's troponin, or maybe his is the low one. It could be, oh, there goes, that's Andrew's troponin there, very low. Um, this could be another person's troponin who's got renal failure. That, we know that that's all stable, so it's not causing any problems. We know there are a number of stable causes of elevated troponin. But it doesn't matter where you start, if you have an infarct, it's going to go up quickly. It's going to go up over a few hours. And we can see it shoots up over a few hours. That's high sensitivity troponin. We know that it's safe to do it at zero and two hours. If you use those uh, deltas that we've shown you, then you're going to pick up the vast majority of patients. Now, point of care test is different. Let's just put those troponins in. If we were measuring it with a high sensitivity troponin, we've got this little narrow band. That narrow band means that your, um, if you get it as six, then, the, then it's six. You know, th it's not going to be seven or 10 or eight. It's six. That's what it is. I should have chosen another number with my Kiwi accent. Let's say seven. So it's going to be seven. Now, if, it's, if I'm using a point of care test, if I get seven, it may actually be 10. Or this, I'm exaggerating a little bit here, but this is this is for the, to give you an idea of what the issues are. The point of care tests have a much bigger variation, so that means that they're going to have more false positives. If say that the value was along here, but the top of the line's here, it's over the 99th centile. Or I may actually be up here, say this one, and I'm I'm snuck under it, but the actual real value is here. So the variation with point of care tests is much bigger. So that line is much thicker. Now. Having said that, if I have an infarct, it's still going to go up quickly. So I'm going to pick up that infarct, but it's a much blunter instrument. It's like when you wear glasses to have a look at things or you're, or you're older and you're using glasses to read. You take them off, it goes a bit blurry. That's what a point of care test is. You can usually see when the train's going to come and hit you in the face, but you don't actually see it very clearly and you can't delineate the, out, the outlines. The other thing about point of care testers is, is that it doesn't measure stuff down low. You know, back in the old days now, this is the 99th centile, say, um, that's used in a high-sensitivity troponin. When troponins first came out, we were measuring up here, and we were quite happy to use it as a binary thing. But now we've got the high-sensitivity troponins. We can't extrapolate that knowledge and understanding of how they work into the point-of-care realm yet. We may be getting there soon, and, the, and there are a number of studies that are working on it, but I think for safety, I think it should be used this way. Now, that's just showing that again. So in summary... Make your own pathway, but base it on ours, and I suggest that you have the uh, thingy and the flow diagram all on a big A3, and you use the checklist to tick box off, and hopefully that'll become electronic uh, in not too distant future. Clinical assessment's still the most important thing. Whatever clinical assessment you have at the start, you have that clinical assessment at the end, irrespective of what your troponins do. You're safe if your troponins change or your ECG changes and you get admitted, but if you're intermediate and you've got normal ECGs and normal troponins, you've still got that intermediate risk. And then, of course, the one, two, three process, which we've talked about. But the intermediate group is the tricky group. So you add on your ECGs and your tropes, and then whatever the outcome, you need to discuss. So you're calling up, I want to discharge this patient because they're just intermediate. They've got dead normal tropes, dead normal ECGs. What can we do? Okay, but blah, blah, blah. Then we need to see them as an outpatient and do a stress test. Or, you know, I'm a bit worried. We need to get them in. Okay, so that's me. I'm going to sign off now. I'm going to hand back the... Uh, questions. I'll release my screen, uh, Andrew, and then uh, it should just function uh, with you okay. to go now. Okay, John. Um, Andrew. John, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, considering it's our first ever point of care webinar and uh, you've done a lot of testing, um, a lot of work on this, and we appreciate it immensely. So I'm just going to open up the line firstly before um, everyone else for questions to the point of care team, uh, particularly the um, panel, which is Dora, Brian and Dan and Andrew, um, if they want to make any comments in addition to what John has just covered. You will need to make sure, uh, Point of Care, that you take your microphone off mute. And if you want to be seen by a webcam, uh, you will need to take your uh, webcam or movie 
icon off as well. Andrew, Brian? Um, yeah, Julia, and thank you, John. That was, was great. I, I'd only like to add that, especially point of care, and it applies to any laboratory test, and that is rubbish in, rubbish out. So the pre-analytical, making sure you get a good sample is critical in doing any troponin, especially the point of care. And we, we can get the false positives if, if, from micro clots, from over heparinization of the sample. So just to emphasize, good sample, good result. Okay. Andrew, do you want to add anything? So John, just a clarification. So zero and six hours for point of care. Are you still suggesting a second test there at the six hour mark? Yes, so what you're looking at with um, each place is gonna be absolutely different on how they handle that. I know that in some places that if they've got a patient who uh, is um, uh, not, not low risk, um, then they're going to be admitted and observed. and But you've always got to do serial tests. Um, the reason you're doing serial tests with point of care and not looking for a delta is seeing that if it rises above the cut point. So, for example, I've got a patient who um, uh, I'm looking is, is low risk, um, but I still have some sort of concerns. I want to do my serial troponins. I'm going to do the zero hours, and then I'm going to repeat it at six hours to see that if it goes above the cut point because I want to catch that steep line. Hey John. Um, yeah. oh. How how that's um, how they we they we use that in practice is going to vary so much from place to place. I know that some places are going to, um, uh, for example, if they've got concerns about a patient, they're going to see them. They'll take the first opponent and then they get transferred to another place if they're very small. Other places might want to make the phone call to discuss whether they're going to transfer, uh, and so on. Hi, John. Can Hi. I? Oh. No, go ahead. Hi, I'm with you. How are you, John? Sorry, we are in another teleconference. A um, couple of points here, though. Um, the first part about every department having to make their own chest pain pathway, I think uh, I partly agree with your point there because uh, Queensland Health has already got a statewide uniform pathway for the initial steps, which is the assessment of chest pain because the risk factors and assessment of chest pain doesn't change everywhere anywhere around uh, from different district or you know uh, the hearts of patients don't change or risk factors don't change yes what you do next based on whether you have processes to do cat lab or not or based on troponin what you use locally they need to tailor that pathway to across with that and i think that's what i was suggesting earlier as well is that eci can take a lead on probably unifying that assessment pathways of part of the pathways and then leave the secondary aspects to local sites to adapt. Uh, the second point was that uh, in, and then that's how you can address the issue of local assays being used. And I think um, Andrew can add so much points to this because they've worked a lot on the point of care community to try and unify and uniform approach to those assays as well. Um, the other, issue I've had having worked with ACI chest pain pathway and developed our Western Sydney one is that I strongly believe we, that needs to be relabeled as cardiac chest pain pathway because I think I find time and again a patient will have some kind of presentation which is clearly a pneumonia is coming with fever and the residents go down they think no every chest pain you have to rule out a ACS I don't know what your thoughts on that is oh uh, my thoughts on talking to lots of people, it doesn't matter. Call it a thingy. Um, I, I think the, uh, you know, I, I agree wholeheartedly. We don't want everyone, we want everyone to use our one and just change the box with the troponins and change the bottom, exactly as you've said. That's all we want you to do. But if um, uh, the key thing with this is actually getting everybody to use it. Um, in the past, when we've had a, a pathway, such as Queensland, that then people, nobody uses it. The 2011 one, I think, was the, the, the take up for that was about, Two percent. Um, so that doesn't work for me. I'm, I'm, I'd be more. I'd be happy to go out to all of the 184 emergency departments and discuss adapting our one or adapting uh, anybody's one uh, to work uh, for them. And I. And uh, the second part of the 
uh, the question I actually forgot while I was talking. Sorry, Amith, could you repeat? I'm on oh. mute. I've to unmute myself. Sorry. Um, <laughs> the second part That's of the okay. question was whether this pathway should be actually called cardiac chest pain pathway. And when oh, patients yes. are very clearly just uh, come in with a pneumonia, I find junior doctors say, well, every chest pain needs to have this pathway, not because this pathway obviously essentially talks about cardiac chest pain pathway. I agree that there's lots of variation um, because our pathway, we've put high risk features if you've got, because we had patients who have died of, um, young patients die of um, aortic dissection um, because when they came in, they got admitted for two sets of serials of troponin and then they died from a dissection. Hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, look, it, it's a valid point, and, and this was talked about a lot and brought up a lot. So, the, you know, you've got, to, you've got to climb through that box that says, have you thought about aortic dissection, pericarditis, blah, blah, blah. I, I think that, um, you know, it, it used to be the chest pain pathway, then it became the acute coronary syndrome pathway because we were concerned that everybody that had a sore rib or a bump or a knife sticking out of their chest was going on to that one. So we wanted to try and um, encourage that. We could go into a re-entrant circle forever, but for me, the the thing is more on the um, what I suggest to places, big, big or small or medium sizes, is, is that this pathway is a catalyst for the discussion between the emergency department and um, the uh, admitting services as to how this runs, uh, and also it's a cognitive aid so that it allows you to think clinically. What's the clinical assessment? You know, as I mentioned during the talk, the, the biggest risk is if you jump on the troponin in the ECG bandwagon and you forget about the patient clinically, which is what happened in probably 50% of the major RCAs over the last five years, then that's where you're going to get risk. Um, but I take your point, the, and again, there's a um, you can get off the pathway and that big box for the alternative um, you know, diagnoses. If somebody comes in and they're coughing and spitting up sputum and they're febrile, and, and that, that gets ignored, then I'm not sure any amount of pathway is going to change that. Um, hello. I have hello. Like, yeah, I have a couple of questions. My name is Marta. I I work in emergency in um, John Hunter. Um, when we say uh, about the first troponin. Uh, what is exactly the first troponin? Is the troponin that they come, I mean, that when they come to ED? And uh, to do the second troponin, uh, even if the chest pain is more than 24 hours, do we still repeat it at six hours? Um, I believe yes. And the reason I believe yes is, is that they come to, people have come to the emergency department, you do your first troponin as your zero troponin. Sure, they've had the pain for 24 hours, but at what stage did that plaque, um, bit of plaque actually block off? You know, where you're just having angina and then, you know, then it gets worse and then I come in. Second is that patients are unreliable. So if I take a time and I say after three hours, after six hours, after 24 hours, who knows? Um, and, you know, what's, what's two, if you've got a high sensitivity troponin, what's two hours? Uh, for me, anyway, yeah, but that's not to say we've actually allowed it in the document that we've um, produced that if you want to do a, you know, a lot of places are thinking if it's uh, using high sensitivity troponin T, that is, uh, if it's mm -hmm. below the lower limit of normal, first one less than less than the lower limit of normal, then, you know, they can go home and that sort of stuff. I don't believe in that. I, I think uh, two hours is not a long time. They're on this pathway because mm -hmm. you think they've got acute coronary syndrome. Do two mm -hmm. and do two hours. If you've um, if you're in a small place, uh, then generally you have less seniority. If you think that they've got on the pathway, then do it at zero and six hours. Um, I'm, you know, uh, I've got nervousness, and this is where some of the problems have come, is that where do you draw the line, and then who assesses where that line is, and then it doesn't mm -hmm. matter how good you are. You don't know when the, when the blood vessel dropped off. We're only talking about a small number. For the most part, it works, sure, but we're not worried about the most part. We're worried about that, you know, we're worried about that one to three percent part. We, we all do. We all get the first 97 out of 100. Um, but the environment we live in means that we've got to get the next two and a half out of 100 as well. So that's that's what I'm thinking. Okay, John. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. No, that's fine. Uh, I just had a uh, question regarding the good 
example that, that was just mentioned uh, before by Brian? What is uh, the good sample? Brian, you might want to answer that if you. Yeah. Um, well, I suppose well, I'm particularly uh, I'm talking point of care here, and the we really require a heparinized sample, well heparinized sample. So mm -hmm. if it's a slow draw, take takes a long time to collect before it's put into the heparin. There's a chance that clotting has already activated and initiated and micro clots will cause false, po false positives. Um, same thing can happen with laboratory samples, although there is a um, specimen preparation step that happens in the laboratory where a lot of that is detected. Hemolysis can interfere with a lot of the troponin assays around. Um, too much heparin in the sample can also cause false positives with, uh, with some troponin assays. So the same same criteria for most chemistries, a, a good draw, right um, balance of anticoagulant, uh, well mixed but not shaken and stirred. Um, and uh, yeah, well, I can't think of anything else to add to that one. <laughs> okay, thanks, Brian. John, um, Jocelyn, has a question on chat room. She was wondering if any RCAs involved. Um, oh, the short, you just given it the short answer is not that we know. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so basically, I saw the question there. Um, uh, not as far as I'm aware, the, the deaths and the bad things that happened were much more basic than that. It was just a, a lack of um, good clinical assessment, lack of ongoing assessment, lack of looking at the result, not necessarily doing it. Uh, and they weren't involving that. The, the, the as far as good preparation of the sample, it's just as Brian says, you, you should, uh, you know, these tests are, we're comparing it to high sensitivity tests and sure they're not as good as that. But the point of care tests, uh, you know, we want them to be as, as good as they can be. Um, so, you know, uh, they're, they're, it's not, um, point of care testing is not causing a wholesale slaughter as, as far as we're aware just yet. Okay. Are there any questions from anyone else, either on live streaming? If you want to, on live streaming, ask questions, you will need to send me an IM or an email. Uh, yes, for Julie, those who it's Amanda are... Caswell. He can ask the next question, please. You sure can, Amanda. Go Great. right ahead. Terrific. So it's Amanda from Chemistry and Point of Care at John Hunter. A question for John. I'm not clear on the status of this document. I just went to the ACI website and did a search on the title that you gave us and couldn't find it. So I'm wondering if it's still in draft form. And I'm wondering how accepted it is amongst your mob. Um, you're right, it is in draft form. You've, you're, you guys have got the latest version and it's uh, just been sent out to all the CEOs of the LHDs actually about an hour ago. So you can't get any fresher than that. Uh, as far as our mob goes, do you mean ED? Oh, cardiologists, I suppose, but ED. Physician. Yeah, I'm... I'm I'm an emergency physician, um, so uh, as far as the cardiologists go on the cardiac network, they've um, uh, they have all seen it. And uh, David Breger, who is one of the lead cardiologists in the state, is um, uh, very supportive. Um, but that you know, the the key thing to working with cardiologists, and and we have a, a for, so for example, we used started using a, a very similar pathway to this. At, at Prince of Wales 18 months ago uh, and I went and talked to the cardiologist and, and we had 99.9% um, buy-in and the, and the small part of one of the cardiologists didn't buy in is, is now accepted things. Uh, the key is uh, you've got to talk to them. Uh, hi, it's Hugh Train with Amanda at John Hunter. Can I ask, so where is this document going to go? It's go to the CEs at the LHD for approval or for... How does that work? Does that then get disseminated through the LHD for action? Yeah, it's it's like a uh, a number. This originally came out as a in terms of the uh, the exact nature of the document. It came out initially as a policy, uh, and this is replacing the old policy. But we've tried to remove a lot of all that sort of mandatory stuff. You must follow this because nobody did. 
um, what we want is is that uh, everybody the 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 thing the the policy is that everybody should use it and they should meet the benchmarks. So you can design your own. Ideally, you just use ours and put your wee bits and tweaks. Um, but as long as you follow the pathway and then use the checklist, which is a state form, that would be reasonable, I'd think. Uh, as to where it's going to sit, um, it'll be on our uh, the ECI uh, website and it'll have um, Word versions of them if you want to uh, alter or change and you know make your own A3s um, and downloadable uh, things. It's, it'll go... Uh, it'll be distributed from the ministry uh, as a policy, um, following that uh, shortly. But it's all it's all in train as we speak. So it will need to be endorsed by the CEs, or is that is this sort of approved already for use? No, it, it's, yeah, we're, we're not. Um, we've already with these things they're sent out to the CEs for you know speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, but it's for them asking an opinion and to let them know the process. Um, if you, uh, uh, I mean, as you probably know about when you're developing these things, they can keep going in re-entrant cycles till we all die. Um, but uh, we're at the stage now where it's um, uh, it's coming out. If there's something that's sort of brought to our attention that's clearly wrong or worrying, then, you know, that can certainly be changed before the absolute final print. But uh, it's mainly FYI at this stage. Okay, okay. thanks, John. But, but you know, as, I, as I was saying, it's the, the 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 reason that we've made it is it's not um, it's not the past pathway. It's not you must do this. We know that each one of you sitting in your room there has got your own ideas, and that's great because you've got to have your ideas, your agreed uh, discussions with your cardiologist, and you've got to work together on it. Um, otherwise, they're not going to it's not going to get by, and they're going to be like the old pathway and sit in the drawer on the bottom. John, I just have a question or more a request for comment, I suppose, from um, Terry Grisol up in uh, Ballina. And it's about um, a habit that we try and discourage, and that's utilising both point of care and the high sensitivities in the one patient episode and um, causing confusion and talk of false positive, false negatives. Do you have a comment on that? Yeah, look, you just simply can't compare them. Uh, you know, if we go back to thinking about that band, the, the coefficient of variation is too too large, and then you've got um, if you've got even that's if you've got the perfect uh, sample, and then there's all those minor variations that may occur with imperfect sampling. Uh, and I know from uh, working with point of care tests myself, which is not my area of expertise, um, I wasn't perfect uh, with getting with doing any of those things. They're, they're a different thing. It's like uh, you're you're looking through the hazy glasses and getting a vague imprint of something, as opposed to the very specific um, test. Um, so you can't do a delta if that's what you're looking at with one to the other. You can you know you can uh, the first test, the point of care test, can give you can change your clinical impression because you know clearly it's above the cut point, um, and then you know that's positive. So, uh, you could then go to a uh, you might go to a lab and get a, a high sensitivity tropo, which show, uh, troponin which shows that it's um, below the 99th centile, and you do a delta with samples that you've kept, and you can get the clear picture. But you're only getting that first glance. It's um, it's still uh, it's not an exact science with point of care testing just yet. Hi, it's Dora here. I, I thought I'd make another comment as well, especially for point of care testing at uh, remote sites, particularly with um, AQT90. I think it's also important that we reinforce that sites that have low uh, senior authority of staff keep in mind that the stable causes of an elevated troponin should be investigated instead of assuming that it's a um, an AMI because we've had um, incidents, incidences in the past where they've been comparing high sensitivity with um, no, not high sensitivity as well as um, just wanting a, a value to work with without understanding the reasoning behind it. John, I think it, have you dropped out? Uh, no, I'm still here. Did you? No. Oh, okay. 
Um, is there anyone else who would like to um, ask any more questions of John? Because we're probably at the point of uh, wrapping up. Andrew, do you want to make any further comments? Jocelyn's asked another question. Jocelyn, we'll get you some, and her question was around, uh, is there any local New South Wales data on the reliability of the point of care troponin? We'll give you our evaluation information, so how we've compared it against um, what the laboratory assays, um, some precision studies and so on, um, and provide that to the group. It's a commonly asked question, uh, particularly where people see a false answer, whether it's positive or negative. And as Brian has alluded to, the majority of our investigations lead back to a pre-analytical problem uh, rather than the actual chip that's used in the point of care or the device itself. So um, we'll get the data. It's a, obviously, we're trying to work with the vendor to see what we can do around these pre-analytical errors and whether there's some other um, syringe technology we might be able to use. That's a possibility. And we're also looking at um, a more sensitive troponin being released at quarter four, 2018, hopefully. Okay, thanks, Andrew. If there are no further questions, we'll finish the webinar now. I'd like to thank John on behalf of Point of Care for a very insightful presentation. If you have any further questions, you can email me at julie.monox.com at health.newsouthwales.gov.au